This is Dialogue. Dialogue, a presentation of the Public Affairs and Special Events Department of KLRB News. And today, Dialogue Assassination with Political Research Specialist Mae Russell. I'm Phil Kogan. Welcome back, Mae. Hi, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Good. We should start these programs off uh, the 3,223rd <laughs> Dialogue Assassination. But uh, we've lost track right now. How many weeks has it been now? Oh, goodness, I've been on the air seven months. It's going on eight months now. Do you mm-hmm. realize in June it will be one year that this program has been going on? That's a long time, probably much longer than most people thought it would last. Well, there's nothing like it in the United States. This, this station allows me to read documentation like we're going to do today that is uh, pulled from my research from government documents, FBI reports, Secret Service reports, witnesses before the Warren Commission on the killing of John Kennedy, and then we go into the murder of Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King and lawsuits that are pending, official documents. And I'm allowed to read this information on the air and tell people and share my research. And I'm hoping the priests in these tapes will go at a national level. But every week we're coming out. I never duplicate or repeat very much. I try to come up with new information. And I could go on endlessly. The, the government supplies us with material all the time. Now let's uh, briefly state what the purpose of dialogue assassination is before we get into what today's topic will be. Well, the purpose of dialogue assassination is to take the news each day or each week between the times that we meet and bring it in, the news that pertains to the political assassination of John Kennedy or Robert Kennedy or Martin Luther King, any of the political assassinations. And I take the news that pertains to those particular murders and show how it affects our lives today or how um, it affects our policies even tomorrow, that these murders are not something of the past. We came on the air at the time of the Pentagon Papers and at that time, I said the American people just have one more truth to swallow, the truth of the murdering of our president and a candidate for presidency. That is the worst bitter truth that the people of the United States have to understand and become educated about in order to know who runs their country or what kind of policies we're going to have. So the purpose is it's an educational thing, Phil. I try to give the names of books. I brought in one today. People can order. It's a 50-cent book, and it's very important. It's got a lot of valuable information, and I want people to look things up for themselves. I consider myself a teacher. I don't want to stand here and tell you things happen a certain way. I want you to learn, because someday I may just stop talking, go up to the woods in Canada and disappear, and I want you to take it from there, each one hopefully, and the people that are making cassettes of these shows and taking them around and passing to their friends will become educated. They really will. If they save them every week and pile them up, they will learn a lot about what is going on that isn't in the news media, the Associated Press, United Press, and so forth. Before we get into um, the 50-cent book, which I see the title yeah. already, and it's interesting, um, what are we going to be talking about today during this hour? Well, we're going to talk about a subject that um, came up in our local newspaper, Carmel is a very small town. It has a population of about 6,000. And in the radius outside of here, we have small areas like Pacific Grove and Monterey, Seaside, Carmel Valley. But the local newspaper this week had an interesting article, and the Carmel Pinecone, to my knowledge, has never really been very political, except in local issues of, of the city hall, or whether we could sit on the grass, whether the youth could sit on the grass, or who's running for local offices in the Carmel uh, City Hall. But they ran an article this week, this past week, called Carmel Close-Up, and it's by Professor William Duthie. It's about Professor William Duthie, from, who was at the Navy Postgraduate School, who served in the Navy as a meteorologist. And we're going into that article because the Carmel Pinecone had three full pages on Professor Duthie, and across the whole middle section of page 10 and 11 are the words, the moment I saw Oswald's handwriting... I knew he had no accomplices. Now, in my mind, that is a political statement because the, for those who don't know, the Carmel Pinecone is located in Carmel on Dolores Street, and it's directly below KLRB. 
and Dialogue Assassination has been on the air for seven and a half months. Once a week, we're making shows that are going up and down this coast and all around, in which I'm stating that Lee Harvey Oswald did not kill John Kennedy at all. And this newspaper comes out with a statement by a man who's done no research into this subject. But across the pages, he's saying, the moment I saw Oswald's handwriting, I knew he had no accomplices. So what I want to do is to go into the background of this article, the description of the man who's making this statement, because this is terribly important. He has credentials that cover the whole page of the article, the whole first page. And the government puts out information that informed, intelligent people use that is inaccurate, and he perpetuates the lie. Just as Earl Warren, the Chief Justice of the whole United States, could sign his name to a completely fictitious book like the Warren Report, a man as educated as Professor William Duffy can tell the people in this area or anywhere he wants that by reading books on handwriting and studying handwriting that he can tell us about Lee Harvey Oswald. Uh, we can go right into Mr. Duthie's background, if you want, and then before I close, I'll give the title of that other book. I don't want to forget it. But the article tells that he had his Ph.D. at Princeton in the field of mathematics, was in the Navy Reserve as an officer, and then went in, in World War II in meteorology. He applied his work in meteorology at Annapolis, and then he went to the, worked at the Navy Postgraduate School. He worked in weather for General MacArthur in Brisbane, Australia, the credentials of this man are so high, he was in the Naval Reserve with the rank of commander. And then we go on to see that he takes large credit for moving the Navy Postgraduate School to Monterey, the Monterey Peninsula. Now, the Navy Postgraduate School is the place where officers go after they leave Annapolis to continue with very technical training in the Navy. And it, the people on our peninsula are very proud of it. And it brings in distinguished persons all the time. It's a high academic standing. It's a dignified place. And this article, by going into the credentials of this man and what he's done for our community and his background, then goes into the Lee Harvey Oswald signature, which has nothing to do with those, that man's credentials. I didn't go to Princeton, and I didn't major in mathematics. I went to Stanford, and I was a philosophy major, and I didn't bring the peninsula any resource like the Navy Postgraduate School, but I did bring them the only resource that really matters in the whole world, and that is truth. And if anything comes out of Monterey Peninsula, I think I've brought them the one valuable commodity that you can't buy or sell over the counter, and that's the ability to stick with facts and information. I can't be bought or sold on anything I say about these political assassinations. I bring truth. And I don't get my information through osmosis. So then you open this page, and what is the documentation that Mr. Duthie is using? It says, Duthie, this is quotes, Carmel Pinecone, who gets many examples of handwriting from newspapers and magazines, also has a sample of Lee Harvey Oswald's handwriting. The moment I saw the letter, long before the Warren Commission came to the conclusion that Oswald had no accomplices, I knew the man couldn't get along with anybody. He couldn't possibly have accomplices, Mr. Duthie said. So he's got a picture of a letter in the newspaper that Lee Harvey Oswald wrote to John Conley, who was Secretary of the Navy, and Lee Harvey Oswald was sta stationed in the Soviet Union. And Mr. Duthie makes these remarks. Lee Harvey Oswald couldn't have gotten along with anybody. Samples of his letter that was reproduced in the New York Times show him as being unstable, egotistical, sensitive, contemplative, immature, lone wolf, nervous, inflexible, resolute, self-assured, pensive, irritable, excitable, obstinate, brutal, rude, resentful, restless, discontented, adventurous, schemer, and a fanatic. Now, all of those adjectives, I've put them in columns of trying to add up what they really are. If you put them uh, these descriptions say if they were Adolf Hitler or Richard Nixon or Gary Power or any other person, they just don't make sense. He's finding these traits in Lee Harvey Oswald, and not one of them could prove that Lee Harvey Oswald didn't have an accomplice. I challenge this man to say that Oswald was the sole assassin based upon these opinions. Now, he says Oswald was egotistical and self-assured. 
The Warren report says that Oswald's motive for getting involved was he had such a low opinion of himself that he thought he wasn't worthy of anything, that he was rejected by everybody. The fact that he was pensive or obstinate or restless or adventurous, you could have a co-conspirator and have all those traits. You know, those don't rule out that you wouldn't have an accomplice because you are sensitive or contemplative or even unstable. You could have an accomplice. I doubt that any one of these qualities, and I've studied a lot about psychology. I was a philosophy major, but I know psychology. I've read many, many books, and I keep up with all the current facts and information on this particular subject. And not one adjective that Dr. Duthie uses in this particular instance could prove in any way that Lee Harvey Oswald was a lone assassin. So what I'm going to do today, Phil, is to go into my research and tell you why it's important that the, a man from Navy postgraduate school has to tell you Oswald had no accomplice, because Lee Harvey Oswald was an agent of Navy intelligence. And I'm going to just read you in one hour. I brought material to share with you of how I've done my research. Now, if I rattle off information in one hour, volume number or page number or commission exhibit, which I have brought in to read you from, I pulled it out from my research for this show. It took me eight years to put this together. This didn't just happen because the article came out. I have been studying Lee Harvey Oswald all this time. Now, when the Warren Report comes out and it talks about Lee Harvey Oswald and it covers his period in the Marines, we're going to be in one specialized section, Phil. We're just going to be in Marines and Navy Intelligence, okay? And the Warren Report has two sections on that. The Warren Report, for those of you who are not familiar with the terminology, because this is what I call one of the technical shows, where we really are going to stick with our data. The Warren Report is a book put out by a, the members of the commission appointed by John Kennedy with a summary of what the evidence contained that they collected on the assassination of John Kennedy. It's got over 800 pages. And it goes into the motorcade and the shooting of um, Kennedy, the selection of the route. And it goes into Lee Harvey Oswald's background and the hospital records of John Conley and so forth. It jumps around. But when it gets to Lee Harvey Oswald in the Marines, and I'm saying Oswald was in Navy intelligence, the Warren Report has two sections on that. And for those of you that have a paperback or hardbound, you can look that up. On page 388 to 385, there's five pages about Lee Harvey Oswald, who is in the Marines. 383 to 388. Yeah, there's just five pages on three years in the Marines. And I have documentation here that we could spend hours on from the FBI and State Department papers and from the Marines and Navy intelligence. Now, he defected to the Soviet Union, and they have four pages on this entire defection, which is tied in with his service in the Marines. But when you open the Warren Report on those pages, it tells you that when he was 16 years old, he joined the Marines. And they wouldn't allow him. He was too young. So he came home, and with his mother's assistant, she signed a paper. When he was 17 years old, he went in. The Warren Report says he was influenced by his decision to join the Marines because his brother Robert was in the service and his brother Lee was in there. And then they go on to say that he had an intense desire to join the Marines to get away from his surroundings and his mother. And I'm going to show you something altogether different about what Lee Harvey Oswald was doing in the Marines. They go on to say, while there is nothing in Oswald's military record to indicate he was mentally unstable or otherwise psychologically unfit for duty, he did not adjust well conditions which he found in the service, and his career was not helped by his attitude that he was a man of great ability and intelligence. Now, they go into his being in the Marines, not getting any reprimand, he was transferred from active duty in the Marine Corps Reserve under honorable conditions, September 1959. Remember we talked about that once. He did not have a dishonorable discharge. He, you see the Warren Report. He was out under honorable conditions in 1959. And then they go on to say that when he went to the Soviet Union, he wrote to Secretary Navy Conley and asked them to change when he went to Russia, they changed the honorable to a dishonorable after he was once discharged. And he wrote to John Conley a letter asking this cleared up. Now, that's the letter that Mr. Duthie was talking about. Now, also under conspiracy, the Warren Report handles 
Lee Harvey Oswald in the Marines in this way. They said, this is page 254, the commission found no evidence immediately surrounding the assassination that any person was connected with Lee Harvey Oswald or was involved in killing the president. And they had an intensive investigation into his life for the purpose of detecting possible traces at some point that would be involved in a conspiracy. And they go through his period, this is how they cover the Marines, a study of the period from Oswald's birth to his military service from 1956 to 59, those are the years he was in, revealed no evidence that he was associated with any type of sinister or subversive organization during that period. Now, the Warren report says that Lee Harvey Oswald was not associated with anything sinister while he was in the Marines. Well, you better believe he wasn't because we're going to go right into his service in the Marines, and I'm going to give you some documents. Uh, I don't know how many people listening have access to the commission hearings. Those are the 26 volumes of the Marine Records State Department papers that I talk about. They, there are sets at Monterey Peninsula College and maybe at Cabrillo and Santa Cruz. So if I throw out the volume number and page number of these documents, I'm going to read it for the people who are taking the program seriously and want to look up this information, and the others will have to bear with me. Marguerite Oswald, Lee Harvey Oswald's mother, in volume 23, says that the police distributed documents that hid everything good about Lee Harvey Oswald because it didn't fit in with the image that they wanted to create about Lee Oswald. This is page 23455, and she was right. In volume one, Marguerite Oswald was saying that Lee loved his work, he loved the Marines, he was a military man. He joined because his brothers were in there, like the Warren Report said, we are a servicemen's family. I know Lee loved the Marines. He spoke of the trip to Japan. He was in the Air Force and Marines and went for special schooling. He talked about his schooling. He learned Russian in the Marines. He spoke Russian fluently when he went off to Russia, and he came home and showed me his passport. After he was discharged honorably, honorably from the Marines, he showed his mother his passport to go to the Soviet Union, and he was speaking Russian fluently and had $1,600 to get to the Soviet Union. The Department of Navy, June the 12th, sent a letter. This is R.P. Brown from the Department of Navy to the Warren Commission. This is in confirmation of a telephone conversation of your office. In response to the question or the reference of any psychological examinations that were administered to Lee Harvey Oswald at the Marine Corps Recruit Depot in San Diego, 1956, the examinations were not routinely given to all recruits, only those who had difficulty in the course of their training or who were referred to by the psychiatric evaluations. There were no abnorm abnormalities noted in any of these categories. And I want you to know this week there was an article about the Marine Corps, which I cut out in the newspaper. That Did you see it, Phil? Oh, is, this is from the LA Times. I guess you didn't get it up here that the Marines just discharged 11,000 misfits that they had recruited. It just cost the government uh, $15 million because they pulled in so many people that didn't meet the requirements. And they want to get back to the strict requirements of the pre-Vietnam manpower level, which would be Lee Harvey Oswald's capacity. And they pulled in 11,000 misfits that they're going to have to discharge one weight, 50 pounds overweight, and others just couldn't make it. So in the last recruitment period, in the last 10 months, the government was found uh, with 11,000 misfits trying to meet the standards of pre-Vietnam, which would be the Lee Harvey Oswald days. I want you to know that if any of you have access to the Marine Manual of 1959, there's a photograph of Lee Harvey Oswald in Platoon 2060 in his full-dress uniform, an exemplary, beautiful Marine, very handsome-looking boy, the Marines used his picture. And one other clue, I don't want to digress too far, is if you can get access to this Marine manual, there's a photograph of him with 100 men, eight that he did his special training with that we're going to go into, but is a photograph of him with his platoon. Now, one of those men was called before the Warren Commission, and the reason is they were all in intelligence. And you couldn't, if you called one, you'd blow the whole case. So when they wanted testimony about what Lee Harvey Oswald did in the Marines, they took people on the periphery that really didn't train with him. And uh, the Marine manual, it, it's hard to get. And if you can get access to one, you'll see Lee Harvey Oswald very pretty in his 
good uniform. Now, in Volume 23 of the Commission hearings are some exhibits from the Marines sent to the Warren Commission that are published. Th these volumes I bought from the government printing office. And there's a long history of Lee Harvey Oswald's service in the Marines. The subject, they say, is in accordance with the request of your memorandum of May 1964, the Warren Commission wanted information. The Cubs, there's three categories. A, the description of advanced or formal training which Oswald received while a member in the Marine Corps. Now, remember, when he wanted to be at 16, he, he wasn't accepted. He was too young. So he went home and memorized the entire Marine manual. And when he was 17, he went back in. Oswald attended Aviation Fundamental School, Naval Air Technical Training Center, Naval Air Station, Jacksonville, Florida. And during this period, his course of instruction consisted essentially of the following, security of classified matter, U.S. Marine Corps organization and missions and systems, Navy plotting, symbols and lectures, practical application of above, basic radar theory, equipment and safety measures, communication, search and rescue procedures, air traffic procedures, map reading, weather, aircraft recognition, and combat information centers. Uh, in May 1957 to June 57, he went to Aircraft Control and Warning Operator Course at Keesler Air Force Base in Mississippi. And his course of instruction was radar familiarization, operation of radar indicators, aircraft warning indicators, aircraft control and warning systems, electronic countermeasures, operation of aircraft and warning installations, and familiarization courses in the Organization of Marine Aviation, Marine Air Support, Air Control Systems. In 1957, he went to the Aviation Electronics School in Memphis, Tennessee, where he became incorporated into Division 5 of the FBI, the group that was responsible for the political assassinations. Now, this is one of the most... Now, now wait a second, <laughs> May. Okay. Fine. Now I've got to say something. In now 1957, he... Aviation Electronics School in Memphis, Tennessee. This has been one of the most secret training periods that he's gone into, and I have documents from the Southwest. You'll find this in Volume 23797, and anybody who's in Navy intelligence can look up what the Aviation Electronic School consisted of in Memphis, Tennessee, in July 1957 that Oswald attended. What did it consist of? This was a special department of Navy intelligence. Division 5 of the FBI. This now, the FBI is tied in with Navy intelligence there? Yes. Yeah, but in the assassination, the FBI used agents from Navy intelligence. And if you look up this very... You see, when they talk about Lee Harvey Oswald in the Warren Report, there's no mention of any of these skills that he learned. And he is stationed at Asugi Base, later where the U-2 flights get their training, and um, he's in Russia at the same time Gary Powers is flying over there. Oswald went to the Soviet Union, and his cover story was that he didn't like America and that he would give them all the information on our radar systems, and we routinely checked them when he went there. But he had the mental capacity, which I'm going to show you, to understand and the training to understand these systems. You see, he's made out to look like a really sick boob floating around with no friends, no meaningful relationships, you see. His handwriting shows you that he was this loner or, or uh, egotistical. It doesn't, to say that Aunt Lee Harvey Oswald had no accomplices because he has those characteristics is so wrong. And I want, I'm, what I want to do is show his training. I'm still interested in this Division 5 of the FBI. Well, uh, should where's I, the documentation behind that? Or? I'll bring the documentation of that. Uh, I have a whole book on that that came from lawyers in the Southwest on this, this is the group that ties in with the space agencies and the political assassinations. I, I can bring that in and do one whole show on that, if you'd like. You know, I, oh, that's kind of a heavy statement to make, that this school, the uh, Aviation Electronics School at Memphis, Tennessee, uh, involved with Navy intelligence, is also with directly Division tied in with Division 5 of the FBI. What is Division 5 of the well, FBI? Well, Division 5 comes under Defense Intelligence Agency. It's different than the CIA, and it's larger than the CAA, and nobody is aware or talks about the Defense Intelligence Agency. It began in screening people who, employ, who are employed in space agencies or rocket factories or missiles. Um, everybody employed in all these agencies has to be screened out, and the intelligence apparatus of this particular Defense Intelligence Agency has more funds, more men, and more power than the CIA. 
And there are some books on the Defense Intelligence Agency. We hear a lot about watchdogs for the CIA, and nobody's gone into this particular agency. Is uh, Division 5 of the FBI um, referred to in any publication? In common knowledge. I mean, uh, the, the people that have done research who have pinpointed the political assassination refer to Division 5. Uh, the researchers uh, pinpoint to it all the time. But the way the intelligence system breaks down, if I say Oswald was an agent of Navy intelligence, you know, but well, you're in the service, you know, Phil, that how complicated the network is and which particular branch or vein or artery that he came from has to be pinpointed by the researchers eventually down to the modus operandi. To just say he's an agent isn't enough. So I'm pinpointed to this particular division. Is this the first evidence that you have of Oswald's connection with a, a government intelligence agency? What do you mean? Well, his, this tie-in between Oswald, the Aviation Electronic School, and Division 5 of the FBI, well, uh, has he been associated with intelligence. an intelligence operation before this time, uh, July of 57? Well, the, the whole training that he got the minute he came into the Marines, going off to uh, Jacksonville, Florida, then Mississippi, and then down to Memphis, indicates that he was always to be an intelligence. Now, I could bring in... As a follow-up next week, Oswald's relation to Lillian Murray. In fact, I brought some of that in apropos of commission documents that were locked up. Lillian Murray is Oswald's cousin. And she traveled, this, I'm reading this now from Computer and Automation, October 1971, that Marilyn Murray is Oswald's cousin. And evidence is gathered by the National Committee to Investigate Assassinations that she was involved in espionage activities in Russia and Asia and that she met with Oswald in various cities and places in the Philippines and in the Soviet Union. Uh, Oswald was very close to his aunt, Mrs. Murray, in New Orleans, and he lived in New Orleans when he signed up in the Marines. His mother, and, uh, Mrs. Oswald, and uh, Mrs. Murray, her sister, had children who were in the service, and Lillian was in the intelligence service. Oswald's two brothers were in the service, and it, the researchers feel that the Oswald was... His appetite was whetted, and he was recruited to continue the family tradition. And he could, in other words, he could carry messages back and forth, even from the Soviet Union to his brother Robert, who was in the service here, through letters. Uh, the documents of Lillian Murray that are written up um, in the computer and automation, they barely hint on her involvement with a Mr. Isaac in Montreal and so forth. That's another subject in itself in Winnipeg, rather, and uh, David Ferry the gentleman from New Orleans, that, that uh, uh, Lillian Murray's relationship to this group is uh, a whole nother subject. So I'm throwing around things that have tangled connections that go on and on. The statements I make seem very broad and way out of field, but they're backed up with, again, hours and hours, years of research that I feel free to make those statements because they connect like you're studying anatomy. And if you break a blood vessel, you say, wow, where did that come from? I feel that it can all connect. And I think you should keep asking, you know, and check when you don't understand it. But there's much evidence that the family was in intelligence. He had contact with them. And I'm just going to do as much as I can in one hour to show some of the training he had because it's very hard for people to believe that a man who was standing in a book depository getting $200 a month for moving boxes around could be in Navy intelligence. But one important thing is that Lee Harvey Oswald also had a job at Love Airfield as a cargo carrier the same date and the same time at $100 a month more. So if the motorcade didn't come by the depository, he could be at the Love Airfield and be employed there at the same time. He was hired the same day at Love Airfield that he was hired at the depository. So that if there was a switch in the arrangements, he still could be the decoy out of the airfield if they didn't take that route. So this... This information um, that I'm talking about, this, the, the Dallas Employment Agency, they have an application for Lee Harvey Oswald to go out to, as a cargo carrier at Love Airfield. And he applied October the 15th, and then October the 16th he was hired. And then the commission documents, this is all in the commission documents, uh, says Oswald going to the book depository on October the 15th and being hired on October the 16th. And one job is $100 more than the other. Now, coming out of the National Archives are men minutes of the Warren Commission staff and also letters of the lawyers to each other. And I have a copy of a letter from one lawyer to Mr. Rankin saying, being as Lee Harvey Oswald, 
could make $100 more and was employed at the airfield in Dallas at the time John Kennedy arrived, it must indicate that he had some other reason for being at the depository. His wife just had a baby a few weeks before. He wanted to get an apartment and some furniture. He'd been in a furniture store looking around to improve his economic status in a little while. And if he's in that situation that he has a choice of two jobs and one is $100 more, even the commission lawyers took note there had to be some reason for his being at the depository. This is why I go back to Mr. Dothy's article by seeing his letter to John Connolly. He had no accomplices. He had to have accomplices in much of this uh, transaction. Now, in volume 23, getting back to page 795, it says the type of work which Oswald did while a member of the Marine Corps, uh, he had classified information which was available to him. And he was granted a final clearance on 3rd of May, 1957, to handle confidential material. And a careful record shows that in connection with Oswald's assignment to Aviation Fundamental School and Naval Air Technical Training Center and Aircraft Control and, uh, and uh, Warning Operations Course at Keesler Air Force Base, he had access to confidential matter while a student relating to radar jamming and identification. Let's... Um let go into that in a moment after we identify the station as KLRB Carmel, and you're listening to Dialogue Assassination with Research Specialist May Russell. So then, May, what you were just saying is that uh, you're trying to establish that he could have had access to uh, information classified of a nature greater than uh, than classified or confidential rather oh yes so uh, to establish the fact that he could have been an agent uh, working with matters that might have been secret or uh, top secret commensurate with their do his duties he could have access to anything that pertained to his duties and that security clearance was never taken away yes so is anybody ever well you've read what his training was what were his duties well are you going to get into that today yeah what I'm going to do is read you um, this is dated December the 4th, 1963, and it's an FBI report done by Agent James Morrissey, turned into the Warren Commission, an interview with John Donovan. John Donovan was a physics instructor, he is, at Ascension Academy in Alexander, Virginia, and he was the U.S. Marine Corps officer, Section Commander Lee Harvey Oswald. Now, I'm going to read some of this because right from the page, because I want people to understand these documents, how they read, and what Mr. Donovan is saying. Because if you understand Oswald's officer, you can appreciate more who Lee Harvey Oswald was, because this man would know. Right, Phil? So John Donovan is the physics instructor at, at Ascension Academy in Alexander, Virginia. He was the officer, section commander of Lee Harvey Oswald during the period from March to September of 1959, and both were attached to the Counter Air Operations Center with Marine Air Control Squadron, Santa Ana, California. Oswald was a private, and Donovan was the assistant operations officer. He described Oswald as a wise guy. He went out of his way to annoy people. He felt Oswald was one of a minority who actually knew what was happening in the world affairs, particularly in the field of politics. He was officer-baiting troublemaker because he used his superior knowledge of world political situations to trap and weary officers. Now, we're not saying Oswald's personality was, he's going to win any awards, you know, for uh, a personality. He did bother them, but Donovan respected Oswald's intelligence. Donovan said Oswald was dependable on watch during his performance of duties with the, the crew, such as radar scanning operations. He believed Oswald's position would be classified as operations man in an MACS unit. Donovan's association with Oswald was on a daily basis while they were assigned to the West Coast. Donovan mentioned in slack periods that Oswald rarely associated with members of the crew, but he spent his time reading history books, magazines, Russian newspapers, and studied the Russian language. Now, this is while he has these security clearances in radar. The Marines is letting him off with records or books to study the Russian language, which shows a certain... Discipline. He isolates himself from the group and is studying the Russian language. Donovan said that although Oswald was an officer-baiter, he was never directly insulting. 
He never knew of any trouble in his association with Oswald that required administrative action. And he said that some of the men actually liked and respected Oswald because he was able to back up some of his officer baiting accomplishments with studied knowledge of facts, political problems, and historical questions. Donovan believed Oswald had a very high IQ, was a self-educated man, well-read, particularly in political world affairs, and he said that Oswald presented the anomaly of a 20-year-old Marine Corps private with an extensive knowledge and maturing interest in world affairs and politics. Donovan relayed that Oswald's position with the crew gave him access to all secret radio frequencies, call signs, authentication codes utilized in connection with the normal functions of the CAOC, and since they were compromised, they were changed at the time of Oswald's defection to Moscow in connection also with normal, effective operational functioning. Now, when Oswald went to the Soviet Union, the normal functioning of the Marine Corps was to change the codes. But in order to adhere himself to the Soviet Union, he said, I am going to give you all this information and hope that they would allow him to get into the Soviet Union. This is my interpretation. This isn't in the document. Now, going back to the document, he said he knew that the displ Oswald knew the displacement of most military squadrons of all the services on the West Coast, the number and type of aircraft of all services on the West Coast, the ranges and locations of radar control sites of all services on the West Coast, and he knew the practical effective ranges as distinguished from theoretical or book ranges on all radar sites in the U.S. Marine Corps. I'm reading this because this isn't the image you have of Lee Harvey Oswald walking down the street or a fellow who goes to Navy postgraduate school. He doesn't have access to half of the stuff that Oswald had. In the Marine Corps, technical information. He said that Oswald's position required a secret clearance, that access to the location in which they operated was gained by presentation of appropriate credentials to the guard on duty. Now, they mention that Donovan says the following people knew Oswald well. This is an FBI report dated December 1963. They mention Robert Block of the Marine Corps, Camellius Brown, Eugene Holmberg, uh, William Trail, Owen Dejanovich, and these men served with Lee Harvey Oswald in this group in radar training. I'm someday going to write a book. It's called Witnesses Not Called, Phil, and it's about hundreds of people that should have been called as a witness before the Warren Commission that weren't allowed to be called. You see, the men who trained with Oswald, if you knew what they were trained in, you would know what Oswald is trained in. Were these people called? Never. Not one of these people was called as a witness before the Warren Commission. Even though he, he, Donovan identifies them as people who knew Oswald well. Who had clearances, who worked in his division. This is the officer teaching physics now who handled Oswald's technical training, and his testimony before the Warren Commission is fantastic. He said Oswald was brilliant. He had the equivalent of an officer rating. And Donovan gives a glowing report of Lee Harvey Oswald, which the Warren Report does not use. You see, they use a man to describe Lee Harvey Oswald's personality quirks in the Marines by the name of Thornley. And Thornley, when they testify, when he's called for the commission, they say, did you serve with him in a platoon? No. Did you work with him in any area? No. Were you in any specified area? No. Did you live with him? No. But I used to pass him going from the mess hall to my sleeping quarters. And Thornley wrote a book on Lee Harvey Oswald in the Marines. And under examination by the Warren Commission, he hardly knew the man. And yet, yeah, These people are identified as ones that know him, and they weren't called. Never called. And by December the 4th, this is right after the assassination, the Commission could easily have called the men who had the technical training with Lee Harvey Oswald. Is there any explanation in the Warren Commission report as to why certain witnesses aren't called or why these witnesses weren't called? Well, the selection of the witnesses is a direct interpretation of how you're going to write your history. The Warren Report is purely fictitious. It's made up of people who had no access to the information or facts, and everything they say is a hypothetical and a lie. Have you ever been able to get a hold of any of those men that are identified in that uh, FBI report? Well, I've spent so many years just until I completed my final research on Lee Harvey Oswald, the agent, and now I have the backbone for five books, and I have never read, reached any of these people directly. I probably could put somebody on their tail and uh, try to find them. It would uh, be interesting to 
I think when I do my book, Witnesses Not Called, maybe the news media or other researchers then will find these people and follow them up. It would be interesting to know why the Warren Commission didn't use any of the men that served with Lee Harvey Oswald in technical training, but used a man who didn't even live with him as their witness against Lee Harvey Oswald. Now, on page 22 of the commission hearings, uh, I mean, volume 22, page 180, is an account of Lee Harvey Oswald's bank account while he was in the Marines at El Toro base. And this is in Santa Ana, and this is shortly before he used to go to the Soviet Union. On December the 8th, in 1958, he deposited $200 into his account in the Marines, while he was in the Marines. September the 14th, 1959, he withdrew $203. He kept that balance at El Toro very close through the years. Maybe there's some interest taken in, a little bit taken out. But when he left for the Soviet Union, three days later, he had $1,600 cash. Now, he had no checking account, and he kept a savings account. A witness um, who was on duty at El Toro Base describes how at night Lee Harvey Oswald was relieved from duty while a plainclothes man would le meet with Lee Harvey Oswald. And he was getting trained or prepared. This is another witness not called who was meeting Lee Harvey Oswald while he was in the service just prior to the, going to the Soviet Union. But it seems to me that a man that can accrue $1,600 in cash would have had that bank account building up like 200, 300, 400, as long as he has a savings account. It would be interesting to know why he doesn't have five or six or seven or 800, because it'd be easy to be ripped off if you're saving this money for anything as important as going to the Soviet Union and you're spending all your free time learning this Russian and this language and you're going to go there and have the money taken from you. But the whole point is that while he was in the service, Lee Harvey Oswald applied for a passport to the Soviet Union with a security clearance. While he was in the service, he learned his Russian. While he was in the service, he maintained this account. But in the interim, he had this wad of cash that wasn't being put. He was off all the time on weekends, and he was not letting this cash accumulate in his savings account, but he did have an account. Now, you say that on the day that he flew to Texas, he, had two, he withdrew $203.00. And he opened the account with a cash deposit of two hundred dollars. Between those dates, has anybody seen the the uh, balance? Had, did it fluctuate up and down? Or <laughs> no, it it had. It, there's a copy of it in volume twenty three, page one eighty, and it had this fluctuation of like he deposited two hundred and he withdrew two o three, but then that's the sum total of his banking account in, down at El Toro. But then he. Leaves with sixteen hundred cash. And from nobody Santa knows Anna. where the sixteen hundred came from. No, if, if the Warren Commission said he saved it from his earnings in the Marines, it'd be interesting to know why he puts it under his pillow or takes that risk when he has a savings account. No evidence of any other accounts. No. Uh, why would he open that account? Now, on volume nineteen, page six eighty, there is a copy of a paper which Lee Harvey Oswald signed when he left the Marines on a on the 11th of September, 1953, 1959, Lee Harvey Oswald was separated from the Marine Corps, and he had to sign a paper with his signature called Security Termination Statement. You know what that is? When you were active in the service, did you have to sign, or did you have security clearance? It's Navy Form 5511-14, Headquarters and Headquarters Squadron of the U.S. Marine Corps Air Station, El Toro, California. He signed, number one, that he did certify that he conformed to the directives of the Navy Security Manual for Classified Material, and he returned to the Navy establishment all classified matter in his position, possession. If he took it with him to the Soviet Union, he'd be in jail today. He turned back everything. Number two, he said he had not retained or taken with him any documents that would, or information affecting the national defense or other matters of classified, top secret, secret, confidential, to which he had obtained access during his employment. And third, he said, I shall not hereafter in any manner reveal or divulge to any person information affecting the national defense, classification, top secret, secret, or confidential, or which I have gained knowledge when authorized by officials of the Naval Establishment. Lee Harvey Oswald, he signed, I have been informed and am aware of the severe penalty for unlawfully divulging information affecting the national defense, and I certify that I have read and understood 
Appendices B, D, E, F, H, F, and H of the Navy Security Manual for Classified Matter. He wrote his name to the fact that the reserve and retired personnel on inactive duty can be recalled to duty for trial by court martial for unlawful disclosure of information that he has been informed about. He said, I am aware that the making of a willfully false statement herein renders me subject to trial. Signed, Lee Harvey Oswald. Okay, so he signed it. He signed. The fact that he signs it, does that mean anything? No, but the point is that he went to the Soviet <laughs> Union and he said, I'm cla turning over all of the radar material and the classified material that I had while I was in the Marines. He said that. Yes, on the air in the Soviet Union. When he defected, he announced publicly in the U in the Soviet Union, USSR, I am turning over radar information that I had access to the Marines. And on the basis of that, Officer Donovan said they reclassified the whole Pacific Coast code system of the Marines because Oswald said that in Russia. He in said the that on the, on the radio there? In the Soviet Union, yes. Now, when Lee Harvey Oswald wants to come home from the Soviet Union, he sends a letter to San Antonio, Texas. And San Antonio, Texas, incidentally, is the headquarters for his intelligence operation under, I'll give you the division in a little while, of what that office does for Lee Harvey Oswald. But he sent a letter, February the 28th, 1961, to the American Embassy in Moscow. He said the petitioner, Lee Harvey Oswald, has requested to the return of his passport and indicates he desires to return to the United States, providing... No legal proceedings would be instituted against him upon his return. Now, when he's ready to return after serving his time in the Soviet Union, the very first letter he sends is that there be no legal proceedings. Now, he signed a document that he's subject to these court martials if he returns. So the very first letter that Lee Harvey Oswald sends, he stated at the time that although he originally declared at the embassy in October 1959, that he was willingly make available to the Soviet Union information he acquired as a radar operator in the United States Marine Corps, he had actually never been questioned by the Soviet authorities. Now, this is what the letter said. This is volume 22, page 16. He rides to the embassy in Moscow. They send it to San Antonio, Texas. He is coming home, and he's not to be held f upon his return for anything that he did. To whom in, in San Antonio is this letter addressed to? Well, I'll show you. Um, you l that's in volume 23, page 16, that a letter was sent in San Antonio, Texas. Um, I have this here among some documents I brought in. We'll find that in a second. The, a the agency in San Antonio that he worked with as an intelligent agent. I hope you people out there are appreciating how many years of research it takes to go in through this, um, the documentation here. Um, the information that I have from the Southwest with Lee was paid through a subterfuge account with the Department of Immigration and Naturalization, Division of Justice of the Department of FBI. And it went, Byron Phillips was the man in San Antonio that signed all the papers for Lee and Marina to return uh, back from the United States. Oswald's pay slip and his number revealed by the Dallas Sheriff's Office, his FBI number, was assigned to him from the San Antonio office Oswald paid at the Dallas Immigration Department. He gave their address in the Rio Grande building. Oswald's notebook, you see, had the Rio Grande building of the San Antonio office of the Department of Immigration and Naturalization. This is a long web, and you know when we're talking about intelligence systems, it's very difficult to pinpoint that this man was an agent and received this assignment and this salary because everything is is hidden. You know how the intelligence system works, and it's only by looking in Lee Harvey Oswald's notebook, you know, what is this address that a person, another research, looks that up. That's not in the Warren Report. The addresses and phone numbers or the offices are not in the Warren Report at all. You so so you're saying, May, that, that when he was in the Soviet Union and he wanted to come back, and he wanted to come back without any legal action taken against him, that he wrote this letter yes. to this address to the Department of Immigration. And said, I will come home providing no legal proceedings would come home. Why is he saying providing? They must be telling him to come home now. And he says, I will come home providing. He's giving the terms of his coming home. He so so he comes home, Yeah. No, no legal action taken against him. Well, no no legal action is taken against him. That He has a correspondence going to Dean Rusk, 
and he writes a letter to John Tower in Texas, the State Department gave him the money to come home. Now, we did one show a while back, uh, oh, not too long ago, on I was going into the psychological personality of Lee Harvey Oswald as against what the Warren Commission said, and the Warren Commission said he was rejected by the USSR and the United States. And I made the point that when he wanted to come home, he just said, give me the passport, give me the money, and they put him in a very fine hotel in uh, Moscow until the papers came and took him on a train you know, to Belgium, and then he, he got a boat and came to the United States, and he was met at the... Uh, port and in New York and taking the limousine to the hotel and then taken back to by a limousine to the airport to fly to Texas. Oswald had red carpet treatment all the way. And the very first man he meets when he gets to Fort Worth, Texas, is a man in our intelligence system that he contacts. Now, Oswald had a, well, there was no rejection of the United States towards Lee Harvey Oswald. And he sets the conditions of when I come home, I will come home, he says, providing there's no legal proceedings instituted against me. So you're asserting that this contact was another in the intelligence network that he was a part of? Of course. he He's no fool. You see, if he blows his cover, like if he says, I'm an agent, if he says in the Soviet Union, I don't like the United States and I'm going to give over the radar uh, uh, information, uh, if he was really a defector, I think he'd be put in the cling when he got back for doing that, for having access to what he had and signing a document that he's subject to prosecution, and he knows he signed the document, the very first letter he sends home is, I'll come, providing you no know, legal conditions are set, and the United States government guarantees Lee Harvey Oswald they won't do anything, and they didn't. Where did they guarantee that? By, they guaranteed that because when he sent the condition, they returned him money to come home, and they never prosecuted him. That's reason enough. They could just tear up that letter and say, the hell with it. Who are you? You want to live in Russia? Live in Russia. But what he wanted his little Russian wife to come back, and there was a waiver, uh, you know, whether or not she could pass a test. Uh, the technicality is 243G. They gave her no tests or questions at all. They said, it's in the best interest of the United States. Let him come home. They gave him everything he wanted and the transportation home. Now, you can tell me by his handwriting, Mr. Duffy, he had no accomplices. I can't believe in a letter that he writes to John Connolly that you can tell me Lee Harvey Oswald didn't have help. He had technical training in the Navy. He had all the skills he needed. He was knowledgeable. He was intelligent. He was very bright. He was. There's a picture in the Marine exhibits, in Folsom exhibits, of his um, grade in Russian. He was tested. He was trained to speak the language. He was given a passport while he was in the service. He had money to get to Europe. He had the know-how to get right to Helsinki to Moscow. Now, the Folsom exhibit, uh, exhibit 19, this is page 19, Captain Folsom has his Russian examination test, his training at Kiesler Air Force Base, his Russian form, February 25, 1959. He gets out in September. They have in the Marines his Russian form. Now, you can't tell me that you can be reading all this Russian literature, learning the Russian language, talking politics to the officers, being knowledgeable on political things, and have the Marines photograph copies of your Russian test that he was given while he was in the Marines. Was there any reason given why he should have Russian training? Well, no, there's just a photograph of his Russian language training. Well, it, it, there's another one under Marine uh, Captain Fain FBI report, July uh, 1962. That was before the assassination, a routine FBI report on Lee Harvey Oswald that while he was in the Marines, he studied and mastered the Russian language. This was The FBI began to keep files. Supposedly, they kept files on from the time he said he was a defector. That was supposed to be their interest in him, but we know it was, it was deeper than that. But they commented about the fact in 62 that while in the Marines, he studied and mastered the Russian language. And in page 19, in volume 19, page 662 of the commission hearings, are the forms of the Russian language that he was taught in the Allison G. Folsom exhibits. Well, in your opinion, May, what is the purpose of the trip to Russia and his learning Russian? Well, the purpose of the trip to Russia, as I analyze it, uh, I also have a chronology of Oswald's relationship in the Navy and where he was stationed, all the different places he was stationed in the Philippines and in Japan. Um, the only way, if you're in an intelligence operation, it's very difficult to pick up um, the exact assignment, like you're going to here and you're going to do that. But there is a man named Mr. Ofstein 
who worked with Lee Harvey Oswald at Jagger's Chili Stovall in the Dallas area. Oswald worked there for six months in photographic technique, and that's a place, a government printing office, that does maps for overseas and for the United States, for the military and government bonds. And you need security clearances to work at Jagger's Chili Stovall in many of those areas. And Mr. Ofstein was a gentleman who worked alongside Lee Harvey Oswald in the photographic lab, and Oswald used to bring in Russian books to read, and Ofstein recognized him because he trained out here at the Presidio and learned Russian language in the service and just assumed Oswald was an intelligence agent in the Soviet Union. And um, he gave testimony about his working with Lee Oswald, and the dialogue went along the way that he was an agent in the Soviet Union. And he he gave out so much information about tanks and trucks and data. You wouldn't think that the human mind... He was like a computer, could retain all this stuff because, it, again, it's not the image we have of Oswald. But he, Oswald would talk to Ofstein about vapor trails that are um, that he would look for in the sky in the Soviet Union. And Ofstein thought it had something to do with the U-2 flights because of Oswald being at Itsugi Air Base in Japan and Gary Powers being there. And in the same issue of Computer and Automation from October 1971, there are locked up in the National Archives a lot of documents, and one is Lee Harvey Oswald's access to the U-2 flights. So I'm sure Gary Powers, in his book about the U-2, feels that, that Oswald was might be instrumental with his radar training of grounding Gary Powers there. But I think that Oswald became a double agent in the Soviet Union. They knew his role as affiliated with the United States, which they said immediately after the assassination. And in order to come out alive or be useful to Russia, you very often have to become a double agent or you, you get skinned alive off to Siberia. And I feel that he could have brought down, with his technical training, brought down the U-2 in exchange for being able to leave and come back to the United States. That he, I, Gary Powers thinks Oswald could have done that. Well, you know Oswald just wasn't sweeping the decks if he had that much power. Um. I'm not too sh sure about the chronology of Oswald and, uh, and the U-2 incident. Was it the same time? Same time. Yeah, Oswald was in the Soviet Union that the, that the U-2 was brought down, and Powers writes about it in his book, and Ofstein, who worked with Oswald, uh, brings in uh, the subject of his watching vapor trails and tanks and trucks and as an observer of the military in the Soviet Union. <laughs> so, well, what was the purpose in, in sending him there, if indeed he was sent? Well, I, I'm was not it? in the the Navy or the Marines. I don't know why they wanted him there. I know how he got there. I know what he did before. You see, I know his training. I know where he was. I know his skills and his technology. And I know the Warren Commission wants you to think he was a village idiot, and he wasn't. And I know he had access to secrets. I know he had money. He had passports. He had correspondence with people in our State Department. And he was a super intelligent person. And the exact role that Lee Harvey Oswald had in the Soviet Union, that assignment, or the purpose of it, uh, he's dead. And John Conley isn't going to tell you, you know, it, and neither is Richard Helms or J. Edgar Hoover. There's no way for us to know exactly the role. We have many, many agents behind the Soviet Union, behind the Iron Curtain. Uh, the minute he came home from this experience, he was in the Marine three years, and then he went to Russia for two years, and he wasn't home just a day or two when he took a lot of documents and information on trucks and tanks and troops and this kind of vapor trail thing to a stenographer, Mrs. Bates, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And he would sit with her. He wouldn't leave the material there, and she would type it up. Now, he had bread for somebody to type it up, and he said it was for an engineer in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. This woman was in Fort Worth. And she assumed he was an American agent by the way the material read. She's a stenographer. As soon as he was associated with the assassination, Helen Bates came forward. She's a, a witness in the Warren Commission, and I have her early articles in the newspaper where she said, oh, Oswald was in my office. Well, the people that were called as witnesses, like Mrs. Bates or Ofstein, who worked with Oswald, assumed he was in American intelligence. Now, my role isn't to say what he did there. The fact that I don't know his exact assignment doesn't mean that he wasn't. I can only speculate because knowing his training and his capacity and what he did before and after and who he saw, I know he had accomplices in his modus operandi, that he ended up in the book depository a decoy, but that he was an intelligence agent and that he was used later in this particular political assassination. Now, Donovan keeps saying that Oswald was very political. 
But he doesn't say how political. He could have been a very far right winger, too. He was brought up in the South, Southwest, military family. We don't know what his feelings were about Kennedy or, or his relationship to men like David Ferry or everyone he saw in the Dallas-Fort Worth area was very far right wing. There wasn't any liberal or left of center at all. They were oil people, and his very best friend was George de Morinschild. His name was Von Morinschild, a man who was brought, apprehended by the FBI. We mentioned him before during World War II for being possibly a uh, Nazi spy, drawing installations at Corpus Christi. The FBI was following Von Morinschild. That was Oswald's closest friend. On the bus going down to Mexico, he sat next to Albert Osborne, alias Bowen, who was apprehended by the FBI in 1942 for burning the American flag, for being a Nazi. Oswald's associations were with the right wing. He lived at the home of Michael and Ruth Payne. We've gone into this before, but for those who haven't heard this show, it can bear repetition. Michael Payne was a designer and is of Bell Aerospace, and his employer is Mr. Dornberger, the Nazi general that was run over on the ra rocket uh, trip. So I, I'm going to do some articles soon on all the Nazis that were associated with Lee Harvey Oswald. The fact that he was political in the Marines, there's no evidence that he was communist or left of center. May, can you summarize the, the hour, if that's possible? Well, how... What's the conclusion why? to be drawn from the hour if, uh, if you were to, to try and uh, come up with a, a conclusion? Well, my, the main point I want to stress about this whole hour is that in a little town like Carmel of just a few thousand, our local newspaper, the Carmel Pinecone, has an article by a man of extreme intelligence and credibility, graduate of Princeton, worked with MacArthur in the Philippines, brought the Navy postgraduate school to our peninsula, a uh, learned man, student reader, and he gets three pages of a local newspaper to tell you Oswald had no accomplice. And what I wanted to show today is that Mr. Duthie has been used, it's one of two things, he either is part of Navy intelligence and he's backing up the cover story, or the man is totally innocent and has been used, and maybe he'll come on the air, Phil, and do a show with me about Oswald in the Navy, a more informal thing on why a man will go in this community and give a statement that Oswald no accomplice when our program has been on the air seven months and I say that Oswald has accomplished. You, you think he would have some intellectual curiosity maybe to meet me and see what facts I have before he comes out with his brainwashing. Okay, maybe we can get Mr. Uh, Duthie, Duthie on the air and uh, that would be interesting see what happens. That's Dialogue Assassination for today.